ahead and point this back into regular session and ask everyone to please join me in the flex salute. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. that we don't have a student presentation tonight. He's feeling like we need to maybe sing a song. <laughs> we'll I didn't see any offers. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, we're going to move straight into um, approval of agenda, please. Um, I move that we approve the agenda as printed. Thank you. I'll oh, second that. Moved by Janine, seconded by Glenn to approve the agenda. Any comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And this is the, um, I'm going to say the first of our audience participation time. This is our audience participation time. And tonight we have uh, two guest speakers um, who would like to speak. So public participation in board meetings is governed by policy DDBH. Patrons may comment on specific agenda items at the beginning of the board meeting or at the discretion of the board chair. They may be deferred to the time the item is before the board as stated in the agenda. Comments about non-agenda items will be heard during audience from the beginning of the regular board meeting. Speakers are limited to three minutes. And I'm going to call up first um, Lisa Allen, and then second will be J.B. Cohen. These are not agenda items. And Lisa, are you come on up to the podium, and Lisa, you're going to say your name and your address for the record, and then we're going to set a timer for you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Don't take it if don't take any offense when we cut you off at three minutes. Okay. But do I just, like can I see it or no? Um, you want to see it? You can. No. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Uh, my name is Lisa Allen. My address is four two two four. Southeast Maya Port in Hillsboro, 97123. Uh, so I'm Lisa Allen. Um, hi. I am the chair of your Citizens Curriculum Advisory Committee, uh, and I also volunteer at Brooklyn, which is my neighborhood school. Um, the reason that I decided to um, chat with you a little bit this evening is uh, as a result of your discussion on school visits that you just had in the work session. Uh, so I just wanted to give you my two cents just a little bit. Um, as a parent, I was really alarmed that many of you don't seem to think that's a crucial piece of your job as board members, and I believe that it is. <clears throat> so, for example, one of you mentioned that you really focus on results, and I think that's great. Results are important. But as a teacher and a parent, I know that's not all that matters. So, for example, when I feed my son his dinner, I always give him broccoli. Broccoli is really good for brain development. But I don't look at just the results of whether or not the broccoli is gone. Because he can throw it in the garbage, he can feed it to the dog. I have to look at the process of him actually eating it in order to fully understand what happened. Right? You have to see the impact of your decisions. You really have to. As a teacher, I assess my students just as much during their work as I did by looking at the results of their exams. You can tell a lot by the process. And if you don't want to be in a school and see what's happening, then I, I really think that you should reconsider what you're doing as a leader for our community. We elected you in good faith to make decisions for our students that are fully informed. And I think if you don't see what our students are doing, you're missing a crucial piece. And I can tell you that it's crucial because I volunteer at my local school every single week. And I see amazing things happening. And you make decisions about some of those things. Often, you should see it too. And, and not to, to criticize even, just to be a part of it. And, and see what happens, open up your perspective, it's, it's crucial. So I just wanted to make sure that you all understood how important the process is. It's not all about results. Um, hopefully the story about my son and me is brought to you because it's true. Um, and really that's all I have to say. Northeast London Street, 97124. I have four quick things. I'll keep it in three minutes. One is um, I'm very uh, happy to see that you guys are reviewing the uh, cell phone policy for the Hillsborough School District. 
I would like to encourage, though, um, to, I understand that it was for a different purpose, but um, two years ago we had a discussion about um, math class in high school was required to buy a graphing calculator. Um, those cost about $75. You can buy an app for $0.99 cents to $4. Um, the policy has been in the school district not to allow that because universities and colleges do not allow that. After two years of going to uh, classes at PCC, OIT, um, and working with Oregon State, um, that has not been the case in, in my experience. So I would encourage as you look at the self, the smartphone policy, to also look at a more positive educational tool that may be saving um, families money in the future. Uh, the second one is, um, I love that little orange yellow sign there saying that uh, if you want to log into the Wi-Fi, um, here's how you do it. I would love to see that at the schools. Um, four years ago, um, there was one school when we were attending basketball tournaments that had it. Last year, um, we became the minority of high schools that had clicked to accept. Um, I think it's a great thing, especially with our IGA with the city of Hillsboro. Um, I think it would really help parents sitting there waiting for their kids to finish basketball or some other activity to be able to um, access the library. Um, the third uh, thing that I would uh, like to ask or, or um, make an observation is that um, there are two, uh, there's been a lot of talk about uh, the expansion plans in the South Hillsboro. And the city is actively engaging the citizens and you people are actively engaging the citizens in terms of discussions and, and will be. Um, the city of Hillsboro started their Hillsboro 2035 vision. Um, and my comment today to um, to one of them, and I think that, that this goes to, needs to go to the mayor as well, is that it would be really nice if both the Hillsboro School District and the City of Hillsboro jointly came out and talked to citizens about what they saw as a joint process. I know that you guys have been having very good meetings with the City of Hillsboro in that way, but it would be nice to engage as a group, the citizens and these two districts um, doing that. So. There was one other one I had. Oh, I know what it is. It's, it's Janine's and I favorite topic. Um, Mike and I actually walked through um, uh, Hare Field about, was that four years ago? Yeah, about four years. Um, and I commented that there were no recycling bins. Um, so you had all these people for uh, football games. I'm uh, sorry. Um, for football games, but you had no place for um, Recycling, and so Mike agreed, and we got recycling bins, and we've had recycling bins. But um, even with the awards that we've won for recycling, um, I still think that we have a lot of opportunity. Um, it's one of my pet, I guess, things that I look at. And yesterday, when I was leaving um, the Liberty Dallas Oregon or Dallas uh, basketball game at Liberty High School, I went to go throw my um, uh, bottle, uh, plastic bottle in a recycling thing, and I finally found the recycling thing. It was underneath the bandstands with a mop stuck in it. Um, I really think that, that you know, we, we preach to our kids about sustainability and about recycling, and yet we fail to give them the opportunity to do the right thing with that, and I don't, I don't think it's a budget thing. I think it's just we, we need to practice what we preach, and you know, I could go through, you know, example after example, but I, I really think that that would be an opportunity. And I sent Mike um, uh, an email link to um, PCC, as far as I know, has not won any awards, but if you go to, like, Rock Creek Campus, you'll see that they have um, drinking fountains to fill your water bottle. They have um, all of their garbages broken out and everything like that, and they do that because it's the right thing. You see most of the students carrying around their water bottles. I'd like to see that as part of our school, not, you know, as a teaching thing, but as, you know, protecting and taking care and stewardship type of thing for the so, Apologize about going through three minutes and throwing four things at you, but thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we're going to ask for approval of the consent agenda, please. Make a motion to approve the consent agenda. A second. Moved by Janine, seconded by Adriana. Any questions or comments? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. 
And we'll move right into our action items. And the first item is um, Adam is approving the contractor prequalifications. Actually, I have Mr. Rogers here with us this evening, and he actually, <laughs> <so> <laughs> Mr. Rogers. Excited. Uh, just and Lauren here tonight. He actually uh, did this process for us. So, um, Lauren, do you want to talk about the process? And, yeah. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Mr. Rogers. <laughs> well, good evening. Um, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the process that we've just completed. Hopefully tonight will be the completion of this process. I'm going to go back a little bit and explain how we got into this. Back in 2008, the board approved a pre-qualified contractor list that uh, we did it request for qualifications and came up with a scoring criteria, which we've done this time as well, just basically copied the same process. <clears throat> uh, and what got us to, to do this initially, uh, back in 2005, 2000, or I should say 2006, 2007, we had a few jobs. Well, let me back up and say, prior to having three qualified contractors, we bid it out, we did things out to the world through the Daily Journal of Commerce, Argus. And when you do that, you're pretty much stuck with a low bid, and that could mean that you are contracting with somebody that may not be qualified and have uh, made mistakes uh, on their low bid, which I've run across that many times. Um, so we had a couple of jobs in 2006-2007 that didn't go quite right because of the contractor's unresponsiveness to issues about schedule and quality of work. And we had, uh, I think, three jobs, one of them which was in here, in this building, that came down to the final day. And it was a real struggle. And so what we did is we looked through the ORS and the OARs uh, about the specifics to pre-qualifying contractors. There, there are statutory, uh, there are statutes that allow that, uh, ORS, 279, 435, I think it is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Don't ask me a question. <laughs> um, so we've been using in the first stab at the pre-qualified contractor list. We use them and almost exclusively them to bid projects out. Um, and this time we've done just a little bit different in that uh, the first time we bid out uh, not bid, but we asked for qualifications for contractors in different groups. Uh, one of the groups was projects uh, valued at $100,000 to $500,000, the second group for above $500,000, and then we did some some, some subcontractor groups, just the same as what you see in the packet today. Uh, and the reason that we start at $100,000 is because the, uh, uh, the ORS allows us to informally ask for bids up to $100,000, so we can go to anybody that we want and get three, three, uh, three bids, three quotes. At $100,000, you have to do some sort of public uh, procurement. And uh, in an effort to bring on board qualified candidates, uh, contractors that we know can get the job done, and get it done on time and with good quality and good results, uh, we're at this process again. To update some of these contractors, if they haven't performed, then they may not score enough points to be included on this one. Or there could be new contractors that want to to uh, be qualified for future projects that did not ask to be qualified on the first one. And that is the case in both of these. Uh, there are some contractors that were on the previous list that are not qualified on this one because of poor there were 52 contractors that submitted qualifications of which the selection committee, which compromised three people, uh, chose 41. And by and large, the ones that did not make the cutoff are for two reasons. Uh, past performance on projects 
and adequate staffing to do projects that we put out. So this is the list here. Uh, the committee, oddly enough, when we when we do the evaluations, we do them separately, independently. Then we get and we score them, and then we get back together, compare our scores, compile them, and see who makes the cut. And what was interesting is that when we all got together, every single one of us, uh, the cutoff line, the people that didn't make it, every single one of us had those contractors, and every single one of us had the same contractors that we. Had that we approved to come to you for approval. So it was a unanimous decision across the board, which I was a little bit surprised by, but that's a good sign, I would say. Is there any order, any ranking order with the numbers that just, with, with, you have the list of just the contractors? And just... Right, there is a, there was a scoring matrix. Okay. Uh, you have total possible points if you were perfect, 110. Mm -hmm. The cutoff was determined to be 80, 87 points, which is 80% 80, 80 of the total possible points. Mm -hmm. And as I said, we independently scored them and compiled the scores and the averages, and this is the way it came out. Okay. Yeah. I just want the implications of having to list them. You, uh, when you have a job, so the list is approved, you've got these contractors, you can go to one of them and just ask for one bid, or what's the implication of having to list them? Uh, by statute, yes, we could do that. We could just do a, you know, we could break this list of 41 contractors into separate groups and bid them. This group first, this group second. I think Beaverton does that. But in the past, we have committed to allow everybody on the pre-qualified list to bid. Uh, it just seems like the right thing to do if, if they've gone through the, the work and the trouble to submit a qualification proposal, I think they deserve to be considered. Okay, so the implication is that you don't, you don't have to make a more public uh, bid. You can submit your, well not bid, your uh, request. You can submit your request just to, the, to this list. To That's the, the implication list. of having the list is you don't have to publicize it further. Correct. And we did publicly advertise the request for qualifications in the DJC and the Argus, and that's their opportunity to for the world to see it. <clears throat> and the intent would be at above hundred thousand dollars to bid it to this group, and every one of them has the opportunity to do that. And I would like to say one thing: um, the first two categories are for general contractors, that, and some of them are big, like Skanska. Mm -hmm. um, and some of them are kind of medium sized. So the, usually the medium sized ones will go to the 100 to 500. The big boys will go to the over 500. And actually, some of them have uh, put in for both. The other uh, five groups are subcontractors. And the difference between last time and this time is that we are requiring the general contractors, if they're going to hire subcontractors, they have to use our pre qualified subcontractors. Other questions? It happens every five years, is that what I heard? There's no statutory requirement of the frequency, but um, the last time uh, the board had made some comments about doing this process in some interval, and it happens to be five years. So if two years from now, somebody wants to open a construction company, there's, there's a method for them to come in and get qualified? The only method for them is to do this again. I can't just add somebody to right to, to go through the process. They do that on their own. Yes. Well, we would have to do the same thing. Yeah. We would have to advertise in the DJC to yeah. open it up to the world, and they, that's their opportunity. But I can't just by statute. I can't just take one contractor and say, "Okay, you can be on the list." No, I mean for them to go through the process to qualify to be on. Yes. Yes. Just let they have to go through this process. But no, I think we missed the question. So What's the yeah. somebody? Uh, anyone else that's not here on this paper missed the boat, and you have you will not accept any other contractors that are not on this list for a period of time, and then you will go through another process. Or next week, can someone submit an application to go through the qualification process? No, 
uh, somebody could not next, next week do that, submit uh, an application or whatever to get on this list. It has to be by statute, it has to be adver advertised publicly, and it has to be open to the world. Um, it does not allow for uh, Joe's Plumbing Service to say, hey, I want to be on the list, and you just add to the list. I mean, the statute does not allow that. So, does that answer your question? So, because what's the, the only way to get on the list is to go through this whole process and, again and, yeah. and submit. Yeah. It just seems like there should be a clear process or expectation anyway uh, for new contractors who are yeah. interested in it to yeah. know what the process is, when, so they don't have to be reading the one ads in, in the Argus every week to figure out when it happens. That's the only way. I would think that we would have an established process that says this was our window of time that we advertised. It's our intention that in two years during this window we will advertise it again uh, so that there's a, a regular public window, not just that everyone can know by coming to our district in some way how to go through the process and when it will happen. I do, particularly after this is done the first time, did get quite a few phone calls from contractors that for some reason they weren't aware of this process in play or they just didn't do it for whatever reason. I get questions from contractors. How do I get on this list? And I explain, just explain to them just what you said. Now, you know, we did five years. Um, if the board decided to do it more frequently, we can do it as frequently as, as anybody wants. And that was my only comment, was five years seems like a pretty long time if you miss the boat to have to wait. Two or three years, in my mind, is more reasonable. I understand you can't do this like every 30 days. That would just be too much of our time, but every couple of years seems reasonable to me. But yeah, that's just my opinion. I have no objections to that. Curious, just, I don't know if you mentioned, we have done business with all of the contractors on the list. Yes or no? A lot of them. A lot of them, not all of them. There are so essentially, I could submit without having done business with you would be on this list. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So then the other, the other, um, the other question. Oh my gosh, I'm just trying to um, the other question was exactly. I just following up. So if I started up my own plumbing business, you know, if I wanted to get in, it, it's the window. So looking at maybe right now we have no set window, right? It just happens where we did it in a couple of years. Okay. We were kind of in a lull right now, mm -hmm. and it allows some time. To okay. Do that was my next question. How long did it take you? I mean, it seems like you guys went through this pretty extensive kind of process and you all came out, you know, pretty unanimous. I mean, unanimous. So how long did it take you to go through this? The RFQ? Was yeah, it was just that once you got everything submitted for the committee to go and grade all the, you know, to rate oh. them and everything, that whole process, pulling the committee together, I'm just oh, curious. Um, well, once we got the, the RFQs mm -hmm. submitted to us, mm -hmm. it only took, uh, I don't know, maybe about six weeks for us to finish that process. Okay. People's schedules kind of yeah. get so, away a little bit. So about bit. two months. But we actually started this preparing the RFQ in January. Okay. Can I clarify? Because I, I heard a do over there on six <coughs> weeks. I think what you said was six weeks of calendar time. Uh, and maybe the, the quest was how many man hours, person hours of effort was it? On the evaluation? Uh, for the evaluation. I think that's more useful than calendar terms. So. Well, I can't speak for the other two. I can tell you myself, I probably put in about 40, 45 hours on it. And that's 52 right. submittals. So, three weeks of, uh, so it sounds like a week of your time. A whole Three whole weeks, yeah. call it four, a personal month of, of effort. Yes. Yeah. And, you know, it, it, it would have probably been a couple of weeks shorter than that, except um, there was some confusion about the process with one of the evaluators. Um, so we had to delay getting back together because uh, one of the evaluators thought we were going to get together and do the evaluation together. But the point is to do it independently so that you are not influenced by somebody sitting next to you. Any other questions for more? So just one more thought. So you said there wasn't really a statute for the frequency. So could you see a system where, like, once you go to the evaluation, you're good for like five years, but you know, once a year, any new contractors come in, you know, then they'd have an opportunity to pre-qualify. Yeah. Would that be legal? 
Yes. You have to do, I thought you had to do everyone then. You have to open it to the world. If you're yeah. going to invite people to the list, it has to be out right. But, but they the pre-qualification doesn't the have to end. Once you're pre-qualified, that's the length of time you're pre-qualified for is different than how often you could open it up for a new pre-qualification. Yes, that's the point. That's it's important. kind of one and the same. So, so, so you we can open it up for pre-qualification again at any time that we wanted to. But would everyone have to resubmit? Or can once you've pre-qualified, can you be pre You can, can be you can for several years. Yeah, you can generally do it two ways. You can keep the pre-qualified people that you have and just add to the list, or you can make everybody pre-qualified again, which is what we did this time. Yeah. But, but you can imagine on a, on a semi, you know, regular basis, like once a year, once open it up publicly or for new, uh, and then maybe every five years, say, we should review the whole list. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. I would, just, I would just add to that, and I don't have a, I don't have a preference on the frequency and how long the pre-qualified list stands. I really don't. But like I said, on this one, we started in January, and it's December. So it, take, it takes a little bit of time to do that. Other questions online? I, I guess I would like to ask your direct opinion. What you think is a reasonable? Do you feel in your, with your, you know? As far as the frequency? What you feel is a reasonable time frame. I know you're saying you don't have any objections to it. I, you know, I think five years is a little bit out there. I don't think that it's inappropriate for five years, but I think three to five years would probably, you know, be a good time frame. Three years, a lot can change in three years. And as the economy picks up and as the construction picks up, there's going to be more people that are going to be interested in doing this. Um, right now, uh, contractors are kind of falling off right now because there's just not a lot of work. It is, it is going up. And it, mm -hmm. You know, it's right it's going to kick in one of these days really fast where we think they're just going to explode. And we're going to need to do this again. But I would say, to answer your question, I don't think three years is too frequent. Okay. So, with that, I need a motion to approve your contract. I'm sorry, can I ask another question of before course. we ask for that? At what point are we going to have the discussion yeah, that's that, of, of changing that timeline? If, we go with your recommendation and say three years. At what point do we, I guess, I'm at, sorry. Yep. So Adam and Mike, would you want that in a motion or can that be an informal board direction? I don't have a problem with having a three year time frame on this process. That we would redo it in three years. I'm just up here. Wait for you to tell <laughs> Well, yeah, but I respect your knowledge and I respect your commitment to the, the district, so that's why I just came out and asked you and said, what do you feel is reasonable? Because I can't be in your shoes. I appreciate that. So I don't think the time frame is probably in the policy. No. Um, so, we, that, so if we can just informally mm -hmm. um, give instruction to administration that three years from now, that would that need to be in the motion. Yeah. Okay. Informal would include flexibility to to uh, drive it in a way that minimizes your time but potentially allows more uh, con new contractors to participate in a, at a reasonable interval. I mean, that seems like a, a yeah. okay. So three years. So with that then I just needed a motion. I'm not saying three years. I'm saying they should evaluate it. And we didn't we haven't set a time before. I, because three years you're thinking of a uh, process that involves reevaluating everyone, and we just said that that was not even a necessary feature, and that they could, at much less effort, potentially evaluate new candidates at a more frequent uh, interval, uh, and still get the best pool. You're looking for the best pool of as, of as many good pre-qualified contractors as are available, and it seems unfortunate we set a blind requirement and then missed out on a lot of good. But I heard, I heard three. That's why I'm asking. Uh, I heard three. So I go through this process. So I, and I, and I heard three on a full process. process. We can do three. I, I, we can do it every other year and, and just open it up to new folks and maintain our existing 
pre-qualified list. So, so essentially, we can make a motion right now to do this, no. right, and then have a discussion. Okay. Yes. 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 Okay. Yes. So, I'm going to make a motion that we approve the pre-qualified contractor list as brought before by Mr. Rogers. I second. Moved by Adriana, seconded by Janine. Any final comments? Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Lower. Perfect motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Thank you. Rogers. <laughs> he was pretty quick. Yeah. Was right. um, and next up, we have to adopt the 2013-14 uh, drug alcohol and tobacco prevention plan. PC. Uh, good evening. Um, this was on 30-day review, although it wasn't exactly 30 days. Last year, two weeks ago, uh, to present the plan, and I have not heard any feedback on suggested changes. So we are here to hopefully adopt the 2013-14. Drug, alcohol, and tobacco prevention plan. Can we start with a motion and then we can move into discussion? I move we adopt the 2013-14 drug, alcohol, and tobacco prevention plan. Thank you. Second. Then moved by Monty, seconded by Eric. Any questions or comments for Casey? All right, seeing none, all those who approve the 2013-14 Drug Alcohol and Tobacco Prevention Plan, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. And Casey has a policy. Okay. Again, uh, same in a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about uh, policy JHFF reporting requirements regarding uh, sexual conduct with students. We had a discussion about um, the designated staff person that should go to and what if that staff person was the perpetrator. What we did with this is we looked at some of our other policies regarding uh, sexual conduct and reporting. And what we found is we designated a, a different person in a different department should the subject of uh, the reporter of the report go to the, somebody who's subject of the investigation. So what we added on here, uh, which is consistent with our other policies, is if um, our assistant superintendent of human resources is a suspecting perpetrator, the complaint will be uh, referred to the assistant superintendent of the office for school performance to do the investigation. So that's how we uh, address that concern. That's the only change we made. Great, thank you. Same thing, if we can get a motion, then we can do discussion. Where's my up here? Okay, that moves that we approve uh, the policy uh, JHFF mm -hmm. to clarify the reporting procedures. Second. Moved by Eric. Seconded by Janine. Any questions or comments for Casey and this policy? All right. Seeing none, all those in favor of the revision to policy JHFF, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Casey. Now we're going to move into the strategic <coughs> plan performance update with Mike. As you know, on regular at regular interval, intervals, we review those areas of the strategic plan with the progress that's taken place. So we have ready to go our five uh, strategy leads, and they will walk you through some of the highlights. So Steve will kick us off. Okay, so hopefully you've had a chance to kind of buzz through the, the website and take a look at things. So I won't go into too much detail because you have it um, right there. Um, <laughs> Well, so the, uh, the, the first category of your instruction has to do with um, professional development. And I, I got to say that this process of collecting what we do every uh, month or six weeks or so is, is a really uh, therapeutic uh, activity because there's a lot, of, a lot of things that we do and try to put it into categories that are important for us. I, I want to draw your attention to what is happening at Greenville Elementary School over right here. Um, you may know that it was a uh, a level one school or a focus school uh, two years ago and they've now moved into level three status because of the progress they made. Part of it is because of the planning they've done and the extra resources they received, about $100,000 from the, the state, uh, to invest in, in a professional development structure that keeps students after school for additional instructional time but also brings teachers throughout the district to work on particular instructional strategies consistent with their bilingual program but also uh, literacy and mathematics. So it's, it's a great convergence of, of um, efforts there. 
uh, and love to show you uh, that, that program at any time that you're, you're interested in. So zooming on down to the next category is uh, how we collect the, the <coughs> and resources for our teachers. Uh, and hopefully you had a chance to take a look at the uh, video. I couldn't show you how to, I couldn't get you into the Teamworks because it's an intranet, but we created a video to show how a teacher might do that to get to their curriculum resources, their assessments, their planned course statements. So uh, we have kind of finalized that structure on how teachers interact with the tools that they need. And then finally, the third uh, area is those uh, communication structures that build our leadership capacity in the uh, instructional um, areas. And uh, we have parent leadership, uh, parent feedback sessions, student feedback sessions, teachers, and classified. And the participation in those has um, almost doubled over the course of the, the fall. We're getting great feedback. Um, it's not always positive, um, and we are collecting those uh, that feedback so that we can create uh, uh, structures for reporting back on, on how we're addressing the issues that are coming up, um, and investing in more communication structures to kind of get that back and forth communication. Done. So that's really working. Can we give you comments between categories? Is that yes. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Perfect. So, um, I was blown away by the amount of information and good information that was there. And so tied into communication, how can we drive more patrons to this information? I think people don't understand how much happens mm -hmm. behind the scenes to run a school system. And when you see all of that, you're reminded about it so much more than a classroom and, you know, with a teacher doing this work. Um, and so I just, as I was looking at those different components, thinking I want not only parents to understand the breadth and depth of this, but my neighbors who don't have kids in school. Because it's, it's really valuable work, um, and we don't often share it's awesome that we're sharing it. So if we can think of other ways to get that out to folks and drive them to that, it's just really good information. Anything else that I can perceive? All right, moving right along. Okay, so we have the engagement strategy report up here. And um, even since I prepared this report for the board packet, and you'll see in there it says one app downloads as of today it's at 2244 so we're at 554 downloads since last month it's going great and i left each of you a little business card which we are in the process of creating and we're um, going to get these out to each of the schools so that folks have an easier way to be reminded of the fact that they can get information about the district on our app um, also you'll see that uh, mike has a twitter account and he is very good about tweeting so please follow him. Please retweet him. 35, actually. 35. I knew he was checking. I saw him checking his phone. He's liking it. I'm not stopping it. It's very good. So, uh, no, he's sharing a lot of years together. Yeah, I've got a lot of cousins. Family members, family members for him, too, Steve. Family members. Yeah. Is my account linked on the home page somewhere? It's, um, well, that is a good point. We have him linked from our Twitter page, but yeah, we could probably, let's see, just, you know, sometimes I rely on my web address. You on I, I had a little yeah. bit of trouble finding him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay. We will so definitely put a link directly to his Twitter on the superintendent page. Yeah, let's think on the, on the front page, right, you should... I mean, you already have links to sort of the district Facebook page. Yeah, I'm wondering maybe if you we have could have sort of little box on. with all the, the social media. The bird with a hat on it or something. The top hat. Yeah, yeah. To be the top dog. Oh, boy. <laughs> <laughs> something. Yes, we can do that for sure. Um, and then also, just to um, kind of piggyback on what Steve was just talking about in terms of engagement activities between the last report we did and December 4th we had 19 different events that engaged uh, 642 people not including the staff members or board members that were there to run the events or observe the events so I think that's really great um, we're just hitting all sorts of different populations out there and 
really hoping that we can continue that trend and get more and more people involved with what's going on at our schools. You'll see I included um, a recap of our coffee chats and then uh, also generated a list of FAQs that kind of were born out of those various meetings. But what I really thought you might want to take a look at, and hopefully those of you who requested this information are happy to see it. It's, I'll just say up front, obviously it's not going to be perfect information because we're trying to glean information that's held outside of our system and it relied on, you know, I had one of my volunteer coordinators do the research on the private schools piece and in some cases people wouldn't get back to her or in some cases there was just not clarity around, you know, how many of their students were those were students. So it, it is what it is. It's, it's at least kind of a place to start and get some sense of, you know, what we're looking at in Hillsborough. Used enrollment numbers from ODE to try to keep consistency. Um, and so you can see all the different things. Uh, number of homeschool students that was per ESD. And I kind of explained how we got the private school number. And then I used our transfer data to kind of fill in some of the rest of the gaps. How many students are going to online charters, and then how many students are transferring into and out of our district. So, um, and then also based on the special program for dual language and STEM. So I hope this was kind of what you were thinking would be interesting information in terms of our student population and what they're up to. So. Teacher focus groups. Are they open to the public? Or is that kind of... Um, to go? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't think that would be... Well, but would, would, would I be welcome, though? <laughs> so, so typically, just so you can get an idea of the structure, we hope to have one teacher from each of our, our buildings come and, and talk about, uh, hear a presentation that has been interesting uh, to them over time, so our dual language programs will be the topic of next time, and then there will be time for Q and A for Mike, um, uh, Debbie, and I. And it's about it's an hour. If we keep it to an hour. Um, so. Okay, but you would be welcome to that. We wouldn't want to open it up to the general public because it would change the right. conversation right. so much. Well, and, and I was thinking that me being there might change the conversation. Too. Yeah, maybe a little bit, um, but okay. we could try. Okay. If, if you're not on your best behavior, I'll tweet tell my followers. Uncle Bob. Auntie me. Example of Anyone have other questions or comments for that? Oh, I just really like this too, for us to see. You know, you did the, the graph and, you know, even like you said, it's not complete. There's no info there, but for us to really look at how many kids in our district are going to other schools and things like that. It's good. Really like it. Uh, yeah, I just want to say I think the really interesting thing will be to track how this changes over time right, and see see what kind of effects things we're doing have on people's interest in the district. Yeah. It's interesting on the engagement strategy how over the last uh, several years we have uh, we've ramped up our engagement efforts, but this year finding that um, just such a little thing like the coffee chats, which I thought was a terrible idea. Right? <laughs> um, and it turns out they're one of our most popular events, mm -hmm. and we get a cross section of people that we would have never probably had before. Um, so just continuing to find new ways to reach out to different groups of people is, I think, we've made another good step this year. And I'd like to do one in Spanish only. We'll yeah, call it Café con Leche. Yeah. <laughs> or something, you know. Yeah, we've actually been working with Olga on how to do awesome. that. Oh, yeah. awesome. And we're, we're going to be attending the PAC meeting in okay. January.
we had 21 participants on Beyond Diversity, which is that two-day Northwest Regional um, ESD um, training. And again, we got really, we have to we survey all the staff afterwards. And we're getting really positive um, feedback from our staff at the value. In fact, they're asking for more. They're asking for longer um, and more um, repeated opportunities to be able to participate in this. We have four administrators um, who uh, went to Coaching for Equity, which is CE, which is a one week CE event um, this year. Um, and so we, we're getting more and more of our administrators getting into this intensive training that they go to. Uh, and Steve can talk to them and talk to them too. It's, it's really valuable for our administrators. And, and Kim and I went together and we went to CE also. Um, on December 19th, we are having, which is tomorrow, we're having an equity seminar and, and we're pretty excited about this and it's kind of grown internally from our own staff and it's a need to be able to bring people together who have gone through some intensive equity work and CP training to have ongoing conversations and support, to take that work forward and not just say, okay, we've done this training, now, now that's it. Um, that's not it and there's a lot more work and so um, we're really excited that this is kind of a movement that's grown from within our own staff to say we need this, we're creating this, and we're going to have our first one tomorrow. So we're, we're pretty excited about that opportunity. What time? Thursday. 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 What time? We one o'clock. One o'clock. Is it one o'clock? Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, and then we, uh, the Office of Equity, actually, we just finished uh, a two-day taking it up training and seeing participation in that. Uh, we had 85 um, it's, it's becoming a very valued training. We've just kind of entered into this and had a couple of our training sessions. We're going to have another one in the spring because the demand is so high. Um, and basically, we also had, this is where we were able to bring in the community. So we were pretty excited. We brought in some community members from Parks and Rec, and we had some parents that participated. And we have our own internal facilitators, our staff facilitators, see you one of the facilitators. And it basically is, is two days spent with table groups working through um, equity issues. I don't know if you wanted to, to speak to any of that, but I, I hear Saidi came back, um, who is my colleague, and she's the director of equity, and she said it was amazing and exhausting. Mm -hmm. Exhausting work. And, and people were no, I would say the same thing. We have just great teachers and classified staff who are trying really hard to address the achievement gap. So this really is a great two days. So the other action area that we have is to implement and refine the recruitment, hiring, and retention process <coughs> that is necessary to support the instructional needs of all students. So we had our first kind of recruitment meeting for the Bilingual Teacher Pathways Program, which is that program where we have our current classified employees who are bilingual bicultural who are interested in entering into the teaching profession. And we had 11 of our class five employees who are interested in this this year. Um, we are the largest participating district, but we have the largest member. Um, and what we do is our next step with those people who came to that meeting is um, we contact each of them individually and work on making sure that they understand what the program is and, and get their references from their administrators to get them into the program. So we're really excited that we're starting to that group of potentially 11 of our class five employees who are interested in this program. <coughs> um, along those lines, we're in the process of identifying how many bilingual teachers we're going to be meeting for next year. We're already working with OSP on that with our new language program so that we're going to know exactly what our recruitment's going to have to look like to be able to staff this program. So we've got to continue to be building this base of teachers that we get through collaborative uh, relationships with universities so we can meet the needs of our district. So we're pretty excited about that. And um, we're building a comprehensive recruitment plan that is including this outreach. We actually have started for classified employees doing outreach to um, some organizations, a Somali, local Somali organization and the Indian organization so that we can start um, reaching out to our local community to do recruitment and share information about the employment opportunities that we have here in the Pennsylvania School District for our community. Questions? Yeah. 
questions about those? Janine? I had a couple of um, um, One, I wanted to mention that, um, talk a little bit about CFI as far as um, um, there are three, uh, Adriana and Kim and myself have been through CFI. Um, it is a one week program, and I think what is um, excellent about that um, opportunity is that you're not just going through the program, check, you're done, and you just did a you know a seminar. You're actually going through with staff members of the district, and so you build this collaboration through the different areas of the district. So um, I think that's fantastic. I look forward to being part of that on the 19th. And um, I really appreciate that work because it is important that you don't just say, did it, did it, and aren't we great? But we're really continuing the work and the discussion. So I thank you for leading that. Um, I had a question regard, two questions. One on the, the bilingual uh, teacher pathway program. So I think that there is a teacher, there is a staff member that's going through that at, I, I saw that in uh, evidence in W.L. Henry. So she has a, they have a teacher in the classroom and then the uh, classified employee that's going through the program who is bilingual. And um, from what I hear and what I saw, it is a wonderful partnership. And these students <coughs> respect and we're working with both of these teachers and it was actually really, um, I, I looked at it as a win-win for all those students to be able, and for the staff members as well. Um, and um, I was curious about, um, I, there's a, a teacher in the district, her daughter has like six years of, of Spanish. And she said she's having a difficult time um, getting a job within the, so I'm just asking a totally naive question, within the district. So I'm wondering, is a certain credential, a certain, is it, is it not just having your uh, six years they have to have a. Uh, in order to teach in Spanish, is that what you're talking Not about? in Spanish, but actually uh, be considered for a position that is it, there, is there a certain certification? Well, for, for teachers, there is. Pardon? Absolutely. Yeah, for teachers, there are certifications that they have to have that determine what they are eligible to teach. But, right. But just, just having the language of Spanish. Yeah, That's just having the six years. Well, but it's, does no. she have to have to be yes. considered for a bilingual? And in the hiring, I guess that's what I'm asking. Okay, so to be considered to be bilingual, uh -huh. to be hired for a bilingual yes. position, yes. we do bilingual screeners. And so we do it in, in the written language and the spoken language. Because okay. you've got to have academic language uh -huh. to be able to teach. Um, I'm conversant. I could not go into a classroom and teach content because I don't have that language okay. in, in Spanish. And so we have developed as a district um, a screener that we use at hiring. And we'll screen an oral language and the written language to determine their level. So not everybody has the level necessary to be able to teach in the language. That doesn't mean they couldn't get a job teaching if they have the right licensure. And that, that the conversant level of whatever the second language is mm -hmm. would be helpful in the classroom right. and be, be seen as a, an asset. Mm -hmm. But it, it might not qualify them to actually be a teacher who teaches in the second language. Okay. okay. That's the difference. The, the piece I was going to say is that just being bilingual isn't good enough, right? You, okay. You've also got to have those instructional strategies and okay. all that other, okay. those good teacher skills as well. But we do have a screen that we've been using for multiple years. On that an outside source. It's an no, outside source. We do it. We've created the screening room. Oh, you created And then we have bilingual staff that are on interview teams that okay. actually do that, that assessment. Okay. So, on a related question on the same program, the bilingual, <coughs> this, the bilingual staff to teaching pathways, uh, you're, you're running this program for staff that have already, that happen to be employed by the district at the moment and you're hoping to convert them. Uh, it seems like the community may have other qualified individuals that are in similar positions uh, that this, this program benefits by helping the staff who are teachers figure out the path to <coughs> get to teaching. Uh, there may be a, a community that would benefit from the same Cool. And I remember it said about this program either here or in some other forum that while <coughs> it's a great program, it doesn't come even close to the staffing needs that the district has. It's no, it doesn't even scratch the surface of the need that you have. Uh, and yet you have a pipeline where you are 
helping people through that process, uh, why not engage that pipeline in a broader audience rather than restrict it to those who happen to be employed but in but in some mm -hmm. position in the in the district? Can I add to that because I went to one of the meetings and I was actually really surprised that Forge Grove pulled out. Forge Grove is no longer a partner in that program. But there are slots open for, for anyone in the public to, to there may be. But the first priority is for district employees. And I don't know where the funding comes from. Uh, it's grant funded. They apply it's for grants. grants for and, it, and it speaks to the high need of, of bilingual educators. And I'm just going to share my personal experience. I had a career with Ali Unified for 10 to 12 years before I moved up here. I left a career in SPED, and I was getting ready and doing my emergency credential to work at Fremont High School in South Central when my ex-husband got the job offer up here. And I wanted to teach, and I thought, yeah, I could teach, and I've got all these experience, I'm bilingual, I'm da 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 Well, at that time, it required a master's program. There was no pathway for me to continue mine. I had some pretty incredible experience down in Alley Unified in inclusion programs and things like that. And, and that took me to a different route career-wise. So I couldn't continue my teaching. That's why I'm here. But, so, I mean, I'm excited when I heard about that program. Um, you know, I've seen and I know personal teachers who have gone through the program. It's an amazing program. It's not only for Spanish. I didn't know that. So if you're Russian bilingual, you can also apply for that program. So Portland Public Schools is a partner. Hillsborough School District, Beaverton School District. That's why I was just so surprised. Like, why Forest Grove? You know, I, I don't know. But anyhow, um, I don't know if that answers questions, but it was. So it's a program that's, that's supported by Portland State. It is. Yes. Uh, that, that, right. that it's grandfathered. Grandfather. Targeted for, for current classified employees, and that's why. We can't really expand it because we don't have a. So it's not your program, too, right? No. Yeah, we're participants in this program. And, and we are participating. We have the highest number, and we even have large yeah. programs. Yeah. Yeah, she, I mean, she oh, raved about Hills Boroughs yeah. partnership. And and I was, like I said, but yeah, I think it just speaks, you know, the need for, for, for bilingual educators and, you know, everything. So, and like I said, it's not only Spanish speaking, it was also, I was surprised to find out it was Russian speaking. So, anyway. And, and you're right, right Wayne. Um, it, does, it isn't going to, that one program is not going to be. No, our it's not going to. And that's why we have multiple partnerships and we're working with Western and we're working with PMAP and those so that we, we're, we've got to so, grow our base. So I'll give you an example. Let's say there's an employee from Intel who happened to volunteer in our schools and discovers, and, and no offense to Intel, but man, I love working with first graders, or I really, and I want to get into teaching, happens to be bilingual can apply, you know, it doesn't, it's the way she said to me is that they have slots, it uh, hasn't always happened, but they have extra slots in the community and then, uh, you know, so that employee can apply and essentially become one of our teachers, right? Yes, and I take a teacher from outside, a member of, the, a person that's participating in this program that was not one of ours and gave them a student teacher okay. placement and they were from outside of our district and they needed a placement and they were in that program, but not with that. Okay, any other questions for Debbie? Yeah, I did. I just, today, I, I this morning, I went um, with Mike to Newberry, and it was awesome. And I think when we talk about equity, and so I said so much equity, I was like, you would walk into Newberry, and you would not think in those classrooms that these kids are struggling, these families are struggling with the socioeconomic. And like I shared to Mike, I don't know the struggles, especially around Christmas time, you know, this time when people are struggling to buy. I have, oh my gosh, I was like, they must have prepped because we were coming. No, this is walking through hallways, amazing, just so. But one of the pieces of equity I think that we, that we, that we don't really see as educators is the importance of, of just overall wellness and how we can bring it into the classroom and attach words to feelings and writing and how it's, you know, falls in place with our common core, you know. So I saw this wonderful board and I couldn't get my eyes off of it, of all these emotions, angry, Sympathy, um, all of these. Oh, did you see that board? I saw something similar. Rage, at rage was a a fireball hat. Oh my gosh, that's equity. It's giving. It's like, you know, you hear. I, I listened to this man talk about his PhD and how he had this in, I don't know, nuclear physics. Used, but nobody ever taught me to deal with my own wellness or mental health or these emotional issues that we face. And so. That to me was really equity and walking through the halls and seeing kids finding an avenue to express these feelings, attach words to them, while still 
being within the Common Core and writing and all of it. So I just wanted, I wanted to share that. It's really exciting. Anything else for Debbie? We have one more piece that we have okay. to do that. Um, it has to do with our level one schools. And so I'm going to kind of dish it to see what it ended up on the report under equity, um, simply because it, the conversation came up around equity with the level one schools and with allocating some, allocating some additional resources. And we felt it was important to report to the board where we are with that on an ongoing basis. Uh, I'm not sure that at least kind of put it under equity and we may want to pull it out and just make it its own part of this report. Um, and that's what the board would like to do, but I'm going to so real briefly, uh, Mike and I met with the two principals of our level one schools along with Dale Spitzer to uh, talk about how we might put the funds that were made available uh, to work. What we decided on was $195,000 to be split um, more or less evenly across both schools with a, a focus on the tutoring. Uh, that we can give the students after school. So extending the amount of time they're in um, instruction, essentially. And so uh, they have both, uh, both posted positions to do the tutoring for students as well as a half-time coordinator to manage uh, because they, they both could have over 100 students being tutored at one time. So my question for, for you, what we intend to do is bring you back data over time, um, taking short looks at data, uh, not necessarily OAKS data, uh, because remember, these students, if, you, if you're right, there's a, a line that they have to pass in order to be able to meet or exceed, right? Well, these, these, we have students that are well below, a, a year or two years below grade level. So what we want to see is that we're making progress toward grade level standards. Might not get over meets, but we want to show you that with the additional support, along with good first-time teaching, these students are making adequate progress. So what we intend to do is bring you back data that, that shows that upward trajectory. Um, and just a, a question for you all is that what you would like to see and would you like to see that separate from another report or integrated into this strategic plan? I'd like to see it separate. Okay. Great. Can I just add something to that? I would like to just, if I have the, the suggestion, that perhaps you look, because there was great concern with the schools and the, the level one status, um, uh, opening up for maybe a some sort of, you know how Mike takes um, board members to schools, um, have, you know, arrange, whether it's Mike or yourself, to be able to take board members to arrange a specific time to take them into, this, into the schools and to be able to see um, what's happening because when I went that week after our board meeting and I went to W.L. Henry and I went to Lincoln Street, I, it, it's not only um, fantastic to see the work and inspiring to see the work that's happening and the energy, but it's also on the other side of that to have the teachers be able to say, you're recognizing me for what I'm doing instead of just saying, you're doing this wrong, you're doing this wrong, you're coming and you're taking the time to be in here. And I just think if you can organize that, I think maybe board members may you know, obviously can organize it themselves, but perhaps you have a lens that you could share with them to be able to yeah, show what you're looking for. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Actually, the, the facilities portion of this probably look fairly familiar because this is the work that took place in October and November and uh, the November 14th Long Range Planning Committee was where we discussed the boundary adjustment issue that the need for a boundary adjustment process um, and we shared that with the board as part of our work session um, but it, it, the Long Range Planning Committee continues to be very involved in basically two primary uh, processes this year. The first is had to do with the equitable learning outcomes, uh, the designing uh, equitable classroom spaces that we want to see in each of our buildings. And to that end, um, we have, at the November uh, meeting, we had a representative from Malam Architects come talk to us about the ed educational specifications that they have developed over the years, specific to the Hillsborough School District. They did the uh, elementary ed specs, 
during the 2006 construction process. And basically, they go out, meet with members of uh, the, the communities where the new schools are going to be located. They meet with parents, they meet with teachers, they meet with administrators um, to talk about basically what they want to see in a new school. So we felt that those kinds of specs would be really helpful um, as we start designing um, what we want to see in each of our classrooms. So <clears throat> we have those ed specs that we've developed uh, for our elementary schools. We uh, have ed specs that we've developed for uh, South Meadows Middle School and ed specs that we've developed um, first for Century and then we're kind of tweaked for Liberty. So uh, the Long Range Planning Committee reviewed those. Um, we also scheduled time at our December 12th uh, Long Range Planning Committee meeting uh, to have a discussion with Don of the uh, tech enhanced classroom because we felt that was also an important component of what we want to talk about in our new uh, in this next uh, equitable learning environment piece. The other piece obviously that we have become more interested in um, this year is the boundary adjustment process um, and that's uh, moving along. We, we have presented you with the uh, the guiding principles and the process that we intend to follow. Um, I'm being trained tomorrow on the Versatrans software. This is the, the it's actually transportation routing software, um, but it allows us to play with uh, boundaries and see what that does to the number of students in a given school, uh, the free and reduced students, the uh, ESL, number of ESL students in a particular building. So we're able to, to kind of do some what ifs with that. So I'll be trained on that tomorrow. We're going to have members of uh, the transportation department actually in the meetings running the software. Um, so our next order of business is to prepare uh, uh, an initial proposal that meets as many of the criteria as we can so that we have something to start with when the, but the boundary committee meets. And Oh, there it is. Thank you. We do have a uh, attendance boundary adjustment web page now uh, on our uh, district website. Thank you. And this will this be where we uh, have all the information that we're generating as a boundary adjustment committee. Questions or comments for Adam, Janine? I'm not sure if this falls into this part. Just tell me if we can redirect it elsewhere. But I was curious on facilities part. Um, where we were um, talking about um, the classrooms for the kindergartners, where do we have a plan for, did you share that and I didn't hear it? Or? We actually included that in our capacity study. Okay. Um, we looked at how many additional classrooms we're gonna need to accommodate right. full day kindergarten mm -hmm. um, and basically pulled that out of our capacity number. So we've reduced okay. our capacity figures by that amount. And then any also discussion about uh, construction on being able to close that wall a bit because I know it's going to create a, those a lot of those classrooms like at Quatama where they have the half it creates a huge noise issue for yeah no I have not done any estimates on the cost the construction cost for that we do know that we're going to when we did this study initially last winter um, we had two buildings that we did not have capacity mm -hmm. um, so we. We have identified those, but we haven't talked about just construction within buildings that we need to accommodate with this. I know that even when we were on our options tour and we visited a kindergarten classroom, you, you, you know, you could hear the noise, you know, and know when these students are there for a full day, what that's going to mean. I, I, I. <laughs> yeah, the question is going to be how far up the priority list does right. that make sense? Thank you. Okay, uh, safety. We spent uh, quite a bit of time in the previous session talking about strategy one, giving you an update on where we are in October and November with our anti bullying and harassment campaign, also, as well as uh, the workshops. Line the safety section of the website. I'm 
repeat some of that uh, for your knowledge if you want, or else uh, we'll move on to the second area, which I figured was the case. And this has to do with uh, emergency procedures and uh, making sure they're uh, simplified in the district. One of the things that we're always looking at in the safety realm, and this is um, how do we learn from tragedies that have taken place and how it, are we building response so that we're able to react appropriately in a circumstance. Uh, I am a, a member of the Washington, the Safe Schools Committee of Washington County. I'm the chair of that committee, which is all the school districts within Washington County. And we, it's a committee made up of schools, law enforcement personnel, first responders, fire, etc. And we get together and talk exactly what this is. So one of the things that we're addressing is parent reunification, which is everybody's familiar with uh, the tragedy that happened this week in Colorado. So once the incident has uh, halted, how do we get members of the school, the students, back with the right parent in a timely manner? making sure that it's safe. So we spent a lot of bit of time, we, we had a workshop on uh, that, getting each first responder agency and what their needs are gonna be, what their asks are gonna be for us, and how we promote that and come up with a plan, not just consistent for Hillsboro, but all of Washington County, because we have multiple responders. The end result of that will be some sort of a drill in the spring to practice this. And that may or may not involve students. We can do it a whole bunch of different ways, but we need to practice that. So the, the wheels are turning on that to get a solid, solid plan. Everything from where we're going, who needs to be there, and what the roles and responsibilities are. So spent a lot of time on that. Um, the other thing that I wanted to highlight too is, again, uh, with these tragedies, the work on our student uh, threat assessment teams and how we're identifying um, students that pose a risk or a threat. We have a standing uh, monthly meeting on that. We're one of the leaders in the community in the state on our process for that. So we presented, we did a workshop with uh, open to administrators to learn more about the process and how we identify and provide resources if a student in one of our schools makes a threat, how we determine it is credible, non credible, and the resources that we can get to give the student help. Um, so those are our highlights of that strategy. Yeah. I want to make two comments. First, I wanted to say thank you very much for your presentation in the work session. It's really impressive how you're bringing together uh, the YAC and Youth Advisory Council um, with the anti-bullying, whatever the message turns out to be, um, as far as whether it's positive or culture or whatnot. But I just, it's really impressive um, that it, and it's important, as you, as you pointed out up there, that it's peer-driven and the work that they're doing is, is great, so I appreciate that. Um, the one I was going to um, say thank you to and, and listening to your organization and what you're working with what, with Washington County, um, again, um, it's important for us to be proactive instead of reactive and the work that you're talking about is is stating that and I appreciate the work on that. Um, no one ever wants to be in that situation, in that tragedy, but for us to be prepared in the event is so critical. And I think about parents who say, you know, we just got to get back to reading, writing, arithmetic. You know, it's, it's a different world. And there's so much that we have to worry about in, and, and focus on in, in students in our district. And so, um, yes, why all of academics is important. These kind of things, we have to worry about this as well. And we have to make sure that students are safe and cared for while they're in our care. So thank you very much. There was a story on Channel 2 that talked about it, and I apologize. It was a district in Illinois that is supposed to be deemed the most safest school district in, um, in the United States. And they talked about what it cost just to get there. And, and I don't know how many schools, so I apologize, but they said it was a price tag of $5 million. But they regularly have practices, lockdown practices, and all these things. And, have their doors that automatically shut off in their lockdown in their hallways with a touch of the button from the office staff. And it was incredibly impressive. And I think that if, you know, as a community, that has to be something that we really, people really want to look at that. They have to know that it's an investment 
from our community in our schools to really get there. Um, but the work that you're doing to, I just, I say thank you. I think that's the only thing I, I wanted to, now, did I understand correctly that the last incident that happened, it was the equivalent of what we have on our SRO officers that intervened, and that's the reason why the student I Did think, I hear correctly I think, or no? I, mean, I think that the no. okay. presence of the SRO in okay. the building certainly shortened the window okay. of the length of the incident. So that that whole incident was uh, 83 seconds long. Yeah. Had the SRO not been there, let's take the teacher that was a subject of the threat and out of the equation. Mm -hmm. Had the SRO not been there and running towards the threat, who knows how long the incident could have lasted. Um, we do know that over time, researching these, that the incident time is shrinking. That's tied directly to the response times of law enforcement, not only arriving on scene, but getting in the building and going after that specific threat. Yeah. So I definitely attribute uh, the short amount of time to that SRO being uh, on scene. And moving forward, I was just talking to our SRO sergeant there looking at today about how what a model would look like to have you know right now we have seven city SROs in one county to cover our 35 schools what would a model look like where we have more presence to be able to have more time in a, more time in a specific school to address something like this should happen but definitely can attribute that short time frame the only other thing that I want to say is I think that we can spend, and I, I agree it costs money, you know, to keep kids safe, but I, I look at the other spectrum where I think to myself, what is happening in our communities and our schools that this still can be? How can we take those five million and pour them to even avoid, you know, these things happening? You know, I think as a board member, it's all our responsibilities in our community when a, when a child, you know, does this. And, and I'm just, I'm just, you know, just, just sharing that because I think these are so tragic, they're so painful in there. And I think that there is a, a dollar amount that can really help mm -hmm. with this, you know, when we identified some things that were in the bond to help with that. Mm -hmm. I think the other part of it is with the, with the work on the threat assessment team, students who commit these acts, a good majority of the time are having signs, for example, the one in Colorado, students have come out and said, yeah, he was talking about this, or he's reading this book about this, but did they communicate that with a staff member or somebody who's yeah. trained in that to get the resources? Yeah. So I think that's also key, and we talked today in our third assessment team meeting about uh, what do we need to do a better job of to inform our general staff, our administrators are trained in it, but our general staff who the signs are, and parents and is there a component to students knowing what the process is so they can let somebody yeah. know and, and how important that is? You look at the uh, West Albany incident that happened, mm -hmm. averted. Why didn't, was it averted? Because a friend of the student said something. And uh, that had all the signs of a mass tragedy that did not happen. Yeah. Those aren't tracked, but... Yeah, but uh, that's why I go back to saying is the silence is, is the deadliest thing that we can do, and I'm glad that with the, the high school students are leading that, and this information is, you know, there for them so that they can spread that and, and, and transforming the cultures of our school. If you hear a friend, you know, and using that incident and transforming, it was averted because of this one friend who wasn't afraid to share it with an adult, and that's... So those, I mean, I'm just really, really excited. Thank you so much, so much for your work in making this a, a city life. <laughs> Anyone else? I just wanted to add, when we talk about preparation, Farmington View last week when I was there, they did a fire drill, and they were out of that building in three minutes and eight seconds. He times it. And just to watch these kids, and they have it down, these teachers and where and these kids were all like, you know, and you know, and they were telling me because I was there reading the story. They're saying, oh, oh you get back, you gotta get this line, you gotta follow us, you know. And I just three minutes and eight seconds, you know. And they said, we know we can do better, and they have apparently done better. But you know, the you know, that's made by a lot of those drills. Yes. The, the last time a student in this nation uh, was uh, killed in a fire was 19. 
47. Correct. It's all attributed because we do it monthly is mandated. Now, uh, there will, is a push to mandate other drills so that we right. can get as good at that right. fire piece as we are at others. But the research really backs it up. The practice, practice yeah. works. They were out. Staff, they were back exactly in. <laughs> Financial report. Oh, I'm sorry. One more uh, annual report. Um, so this is, I, I think I would call this a vestige of board policy. It's an extremely brief policy that um, calls for an annual report to be created. And in prior years, there have been different takes on the annual report and, and what it should comprise. You know, several years ago, there was slick pretty in about 50 pages, you know, outside contractor hired to do it, professional printing. You know, the last several years we've created something a lot um, more streamlined and, and just meant to be a kind of a snapshot. Well, this year, as we moved into year three of our strategic plan, um, we wanted to get a lot better about producing information that was really indicative of what our student achievement picture looked like in our district. And we have that plan for you in the spring. Uh, the timing of spring is also very useful because by then we will have all pertinent uh, data for last year. Right now we don't have the finalized grad rates for uh, 2013, so by the spring we will have that. So um, in thinking about, you know, why would we have kind of this annual report that's a little odd anyway, it doesn't have all the correct, or you know, all the current data, and then also be putting out the student achievement report that seems to go over a lot of the same ground. And then looking at the policy itself, the language in it really seems to tie directly to the release of state and district report cards, or school and district report cards, sorry, that are uh, produced by the state. So um, my thought was, and uh, cabinet sort of agreed with me, unless you don't like the idea, in which case it was all my decision. <laughs> was, if you love it, it was definitely my decision. Um, so it was to basically give people with our, you know, to not necessarily call it an annual report, but really call it kind of a, a summary of, of school and district data for the year. And that is as reported by the school and district report cards produced by the state. And to give people a one-stop shopping place where at a glance in one document they could get a sense of you know performance across the district as it relates to the various things tracked by uh, ODE. So that's what I have attempted to do with, with this spreadsheet which was in the packet and um, it uses both obviously you know data cells and color to tell you a story about um, the achievement within different categories. Um, in any category where there was uh, a level assigned or whether they could assess us versus schools or districts of similar demographics and, and other statistics, then um, I went ahead and used a color to give people that sense of, oh, okay, we're better than a, a school or district that's similar to us or maybe or maybe we're not for any given reason. So, you know, it's, it's dense with information, but at the same time, I hope that it's kind of a, a bit of a useful tool. And then I also kind of summarize down at the bottom some information about, you know, in categories where you could track how we performed versus our comparator districts. So, Certainly open to any feedback. This isn't something for which we ask for a board vote, but of course I'm, I'm certainly wanting to put something out that you feel good about and you feel is useful to our community. So if you would like to see it changed or have comments, I'm open to that. These are state numbers that we put in here? This is, yeah, in, in the October, I think it was, ODE released the official state and district report cards. So. These are the data points that were reported. So each school and for our district, we have you know a multi-page report, and they're all on the website as well. But so 
you know, that takes a couple hundred pages worth of information and, and condenses it onto an 11 by 17 sheet. <laughs> I'm just looking at the completion rate of 87.4. Uh -huh. I look down under the high schools and there's nobody under 89%. Down at the bottom. So, I don't see how... We well, the district gets... Has, I mean, and this, like I said, this is all state data, but the right. district gets um, other students that aren't necessarily enrolled in our high schools counted towards us. Like students in external placements, and you know, I'm not sure exactly who all is in that. So those those folks are bringing down the average, <laughs> opposed to our motor motor driven high schools, correct? Yeah, our high schools are rocking it for graduate. Yeah, I mean, those numbers are real good. Our grad rates are important, you know. I'm so glad we're all sitting. Anyone else have questions or comments on the report? Just nice. I just want to thank you guys for your yeah. reports. They were really clear. I love you know how simple you made the page for us to go on there. Just a lot of work. So one page, beautiful. I appreciate it. Yeah, a lot of work, and I will you know, right? And we're giving yeah. you all. <laughs> I would also reiterate what Kim said and the ability, the, the amount of work that you put into all the reports before on the strategic plan. I mean, to be able to get that out at a, at a spot where everyone can really look at all that is great. Would be great. Thank you. Sorry, I didn't mean to gloss over your report. No, no, I accidentally yeah. crossed it right off. Just anxious. Yeah. 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 I'm trying to keep Monty happy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so, a couple of uh, things happening in the, the business office this year. First of all, or this month, one thing I'd really like to highlight is that we are finally ready to release our student body accounting manual. This is a manual that will go out each of our um, office managers and bookkeepers um, with basically our expectations of how they manage their student body accounts. Um, we've had bits and pieces of this uh, in the past, but Ann Ballard, our um, CPA, has compiled all this and uh, I think she's put together a really good document. So I'm um, really excited about that. We're working on it for a long time. Um, the other big thing that's happening right now in the business office and HR and technology is that we've got um, somebody in from Tyler Technologies. They're the parent company of Infinite Visions, our business and um, HR software. And they're doing a, a, what they're calling a best practices review. We've been with the system now for five years and um, we are bringing in one of their um, trainers to basically observe how we're using the, the system and give us feedback on what we could be doing differently, better, more efficiently. So um, we're, today was the second day of that review. Um, they'll finish up their work tomorrow and then provide us with the report. So we're um, really looking forward to getting that back. So, and be happy to answer any other questions. Anyone have questions, comments? All right. Thank you, Alan. And next up, we have Maureen with PTA. Hi, I thought that since this was the last meeting of 2013, I would do some New Year resolutions. <laughs> um, and the first is to resolve that we seek statewide solutions to secure adequate support, I'm not just saying funding, but support for public education. Mm -hmm. Um, that we promote a realistic recognition of the efforts that we're all making toward providing physically safe and intellectually challenging learning environments. And that these resolutions help reduce the stress that's being created by the unrelenting expectations on public education and to celebrate the progress that we make because we do just keep going and I think the new year speaks to that. Thank you. Thank you. And next step. Yep. Can I ask a question now that yeah. but I was curious about HCU. We haven't heard from HCU in a little bit. Um, um, Eric's wife is pregnant. 
to us out. He's missing a few things for that. We did have um, an HCU rep that was at the at, uh, upstairs um, oh. in the work session. Oh, okay. She, yeah. She's their secretary, Shar Schuster. Um, oh. But she told me she was unable to stay for the rest of the meeting. Okay. So that's just curious. Okay. Tim, I also just met with Eric this last yeah. week as well. Oh. So we're we're in communication. Yeah. Oh, I didn't think that you were. Yeah. I didn't think you're like you know. No. But I, I just want to just he because. Stopped. Okay. <laughs> huh? No, it's not. <laughs> no, it's not. Good question. All right. All right, I will make this brief. We had a uh, tag informational, actually a tag, tag night last week where we were wanting to gather information from tag parents. And basically the goal of the meeting was to determine how can we provide a better tag program for our students that are involved. And uh, so really that's what the whole intent of the meeting was. We had uh, parents weighing in and uh, sitting in small groups and putting things on chart paper. And we've got some deliverables that we feel like we can uh, make happen in the next couple months. And some other ideas that are going to be more long term in nature. But it was a, it was a great meeting and uh, um, it was actually an idea that came out of one of our coffee chats. That, mm -hmm. uh, uh, we always have parents that uh, bring up certain items and that one has been a pattern. And so that seemed to be a good, a good avenue for us to take. Um, have had a number of great visits with board members. Thank you for making yourselves available for the school visits. It's been, uh, it's been great to, uh, to visit schools with you. I think we visited together five or six schools in the last couple of weeks and that is, uh, I know that uh, not only you learn a lot when you go, but the staff members also appreciate it when we're out there. Um, Finally, I'd like to thank you as we wind down 2013. Thank you for all your time and energy and commitment, and uh, hope you have a great break. Thank you. Okay, I think it's very fast. I have time, so I'm starting off. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay, well, um, I don't have a whole lot other than saying uh, uh, Merry Christmas and Happy New Year to all my friends and colleagues and whatnot, and I'll, I'll do this in uh, the land that I was born. Mere kuhimaka e haumimaki yo. Oh. It's Norway. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. All right, so everybody has to say it in a different language. Um, Janine. Um, I just wanted to say that um, one of the visits that I was able to do was invited to uh, Miss Underhill's class from Lincoln Street and um, to read and join them for lunch bunch and. Um, it was very adorable that these kids write the little thank yous, and one of the things they write is, to make the Grinch t grin, I would, and she says, I will make him bed and clean him house by Jennifer. <laughs> it was really cute. Some of them wanted to help the Grinch with, their, <laughs> with, his, uh, with his work, and some of them wanted him with cookies and everything else, and um, I just thought that was adorable to read and brought a smile to my face, and I thank whoever organized the artwork and I haven't had a chance to look up close and personal, um, but it's always fantastic to be able to see that represented in our district. Um, and that was actually uh, from a Hillsborough Schools Foundation grant. Oh, the fantastic. project was called Home Homeless, and students had to, you know, go through this process of evaluating what those concepts meant to them, the concept of home, and what it would mean to be homeless. Oh, and they did block prints. Wow. Yeah. That's and there's uh, those papers up there have yeah. some reflections. So. That's what I was, I haven't had a chance to go up there. So, uh, so thank you very much. Um, and I wanted to say thank you to Mike and to the staff for organizing the options tour. Um, I thought it was incredibly enlightening and to be able to see the good work in, in our districts as a group. Um, and just to be able to see the kids, you know, under their microscopes and doing all that they're doing um, was great. And um, I wanted to mention that I, this, for the third year now I've done these, um, I go around to the, in December and read to the elementary schools and um, I usually read How the Grinch Stole Christmas and I have been to 19 schools so far, um, including um, City View Charter and I want to say that there's a few things that I absolutely love about this opportunity. Not only do I love to read, but um, it's also, you just be able to see a snapshot. You see a, sna a quick snapshot into these schools. I go and I take a bunch of pictures. I have a Facebook page, and I have like inside Tobias Elementary School. Inside, and all the things that, and you're able to see the different flavors, the different things that each school represents. But you also see the similarities. So you see things like um, the I am uh, poems and stories, which are student reflections as to how they 
what, what they're about and what their world is about and, what, and how that makes who they are. And some of them are, are deeply and insightful and um, funny. And they have other ones. Um, Mrs. White's third grade class at Indian Hills. I have to read this. This is one of my favorites. They write, My Best Friend. I ran into Duke, then we became friends. We were sent to the office, both of us were bloody. Duke and I were apologizing. He accepted my apology, and I did too. We crashed into each other, and he made a tooth mark on my head, and his teeth are very loose. And you could pull them out, so you can see how we became friends. <laughs> and that is just, those are third graders, and I just absolutely love that, that whenever you go into these schools and you see that, it's amazing, and the connections you make to be able to read in Mrs. Rose's um, first grade class at Tobias Elementary School, and then to have all those first graders say to you, are you going to come to lunch with us? And you're, I'm like, uh -huh. <laughs> I really want to. And I was actually very lucky that when we did the options tour, I was able to sit at their table and have lunch with them. And they went back, and I got a text from the teacher. So um, it was pretty exciting to be able to make those connections. And um, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. I wish you all um, happy, happy holidays and joy. And uh, thank you very much. One tea. Uh, first of all, I'd like to apologize for coming across that I didn't think school visits were important. I think they're very important. Uh, uh, I don't think with, without good processes, we don't have good results. So if I came across other than that, I apologize. Uh, happy holidays to everybody, and uh, thank you for all your hard work. Yeah, um, nothing much to add. Uh, have a Merry Christmas and Happy Holidays. Mm -hmm. um, I just want to say I'm so excited that we have audience time up front. I mean, first, because it is, you know, I think as board members, you know, listening to to what you had to say up front in the beginning of our meeting was awesome. So I was just really excited that we, you don't have to wait till the very end to share. And you still stayed. Today. And you still stayed. So, but I, that just to me was, I uh, was good because you keep us on our toes and keep us accountable, right? So, um, I, I mentioned about my meeting and my visit today, and it was just, it, it's so hard to believe that Mugari, what, two years ago, three years ago, was where they were at and to see where they were at. Those kids were fully engaged in learning. They were using words that didn't change the structure. What was it? But the perspective is still the same. Or, and I, I was just learning and using the cubes and turning it around. And what is it, that, that Elmo that she shed? I was just like, wow, blown away. Zero behavior problems. All kids engaged. You would never even think that those kids are drawing from the socioeconomic level that they're drawing from. The grandmas, oh my goodness, the grandmas that all walked in for reading. Do you know how critical it is for these kids to have grandmas and grandpas and intergenerational? A lot of our kids don't have that opportunity, like mine. They used to call my neighbor's grandma. My kids, they didn't have grandmas here. So for me, when I saw that, it just, wow. Now, I, I, I know he planned this. There couldn't have been that much goodness going on in one day. Because then that, and then, and then in the passing, a hallway, another volunteer, an older gentleman leading a group with a smart sign. And I said, wow, you must be smart, because you're going down. I'm smart. You know, walk down the hallway. I was just, I mean, I had a blast. It, it just, it makes, and that's why I think the visits, I feel they're important because they inspire me, you know, to come, you know, and to, and to do the work here. When I go and listen to kids and the first child that we walk into the high school, the club sees my first time, obviously my looks like someone important. Telling, telling us how we had to wash his hands because they're going to make Christmas tree paints and did in the hallway stop to let us know that. So, just, uh, it was amazing. Um, my New Year's resolution, if you want to say that, and I think you touched on it, was just to do a gratitude journal, you know, and just have gratitude for, for the amazing things that are happening in all our lives and our schools and really let our teachers know that because it's a tough job. And I think last, last board session, I just kind of want to clarify that we're on a clarification. I mentioned something about specialists, and I think the assumption was made that I was talking about doing away with specialists. We need specialists, but we need specialists in the sense of helping our classroom teachers in the sense of, you know, looking at the curriculum and saying, well, you know, do this activity and this is how you accommodate, but I'm going to go in there and model and I'm going to show you and I'm going to, and that's kind of what I was, rather than to pull out and create a separate 
You know, I just, I see my vision of the classroom is a fully included classroom with a smaller size. That's just my vision. Um, but where we have the impact of, of the specialists coming into the classroom where we can say, yeah, you know, we have 29 to 1 or 30 to 1, but the reality is, is some students are touched by how many adults in one day, so our ratio really goes down. There's things that are happening in the classroom that when you go there, you, you see. So I just wanted to kind of clarify that. Um, but other than that, I'm excited, excited for a whole new year, and thank you all. I have so much gratitude to being on the board with so many people with differences and opinions that I think just make me a stronger and better person. So, thanks. Okay. The risk of becoming emotional. <laughs> no, it was, uh, the past two weeks was uh, great. If you missed, uh, you know, there was some STEM touring going, uh, going around. Uh, the, uh, these past two weekends was the, the culmination event for uh, several of the kind of leading STEM programs in the district and across the state uh, with the robotics uh, for all levels from junior FLL uh, clear up through uh, the middle school and early high school uh, through uh, FLL and FR, uh, FPC. Uh, these are bringing kids together, not just for uh, single events, but uh, these are culmination events of research projects uh, that involve uh, uh, scientific investigations, uh, solving problems that have nothing to do with the LEGO side. In addition to the uh, teamwork events, the raising of incredible amounts of funds to support their own programs, uh, to interacting with businesses, uh, to get uh, uh, funding and uh, support uh, and not to mention rallying of parents and teachers, uh, administrators, building support. I watched uh, the high school uh, team come together on Saturday uh, to uh, essentially uh, staff the event uh, for the middle schoolers uh, as they uh, ran the program. The, this is the Glen, Cl uh, Glen Co. Uh, robotics team whose name slips my mind at the moment. Shockwave, Shockwave. there you go. Uh, uh, Shockwave uh, uh, put on a great event there, uh, had the chance to hang out and uh, talk and uh, just uh, work with a bunch of, a bunch of kids from all, uh, all backgrounds coming together to uh, show excitement and, and those are the exact the kind of uh, activities that we want to engage, uh, continue to engage in some point. So it's been a great couple of weeks of STEM activity that will uh, carry on uh, in the uh, future. So, uh, good times. Um, Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Uh, wish everyone the best. Uh, and see you next year. Um, I also wanted to thank uh, Mike and staff for putting together the options tour. It was very fun. Even though it was schools I have already visited, it's amazing how you always learn something new or um, just have fun experiences. And um, it was fun to get down on the ground and interact with students and help them in their work and um, learn from them and I think STEAM is where it's at and so I thoroughly well, I enjoyed the whole day really enjoyed the Dama. I just think there's so much um, STEAM magic happening there. Same thing my son and husband just volunteered for a weekend of the robotics and it's amazing how much you learned um, on those projects that so it's not just a little weekend thing. Um, and happy holidays to everybody. Enjoy break. Hopefully everyone's taking time off and being spent time with friends and family. And with that, we are...